Uh, Gary Breen, good morning to you. How you doing? Morning, guys. Um, have Chelsea down tools on Antonio Conte? And did they actually do it about five weeks ago? Uh, quite possibly, because you look at the reaction of some of their players. And obviously, when a player's been dropped out of the team and then gets back in the likes of David Luiz, just see his reaction to that fourth goal where he leaves his slot and just ambles out and then jogs back in. And the problem he has is... When he won the title last season, he obviously felt that he was able to flex his muscles and get the type of control that few Chelsea managers before him have ever had. That didn't materialise. But even his handling of the Costa situation, he made a rod for his own back. Costa would have a lot of friends within that Chelsea squad, the way he was ostracised. And even the way Conte, foolishly really, for a manager of his experience, just to text that message, he really undermined the club's position in trying to sell him then because it looked like Costa was only ever going to go to Atletico. And it just meant that they were going to struggle to get a, a valuable fee for him. They ended up getting a good one, but there just seems to be so many mistakes made by Conte. Trying to take on the board, the owner, that's never, ever going to materialise in his favour. He's never going to win that battle. And now you see, a, a, an obviously, a, a very demonstrative, passionate man, but a temperamental man as well. So I, I don't see this ending well. So if you're Chelsea, do you just fire him now and move on to next season already and try and get the manager you want? I mean, Ancelotti is available out there who could actually you know, guarantee you a place in the top four if things turned round and try and build the next season. You know, if you do you rip the plaster off now or do you wait until the end of the season? Well, listen, they've done that many times before. I think they'll literally be looking at their options quite rightly. And, and looking at Antonio Conte, it looks like that's what he wants. He just seems to be provoking the owners every time he speaks in front of the, the camera to the press to the supporters in terms of saying like well listen if they've got a decision to make make it and you just think I, I, it's so unnecessary because he's a brilliant manager but you could just tell from the beginning of this season he wasn't particularly happy being there the very fact that he didn't extend his contract only improved his terms suggests that he didn't see it as a long-term fix and i think you're right i think they will look at who's available luis enrique of course is on a sabbatical from barcelona he might be a, a type of manager that would fit them. Certainly, the Atletico Madrid manager is someone they've always courted, but whether or not they can get him out of there remains to be seen. And you're right, they may well go back to play managers that they've had before. They've done that with Gus Hiddink coming in just to steady the ship, just to allow the board some time to, to get the manager in that they want. But certainly, it's a major disappointment, but not something we haven't seen before with Chelsea. As you guys quite rightly said about Mourinho and that group of players downing tools on him. And Conte said... He didn't want to have a Mourinho season one. Unfortunately, he's having one. Yeah. I, do the players have to shoulder any responsibility? Or Sorry, of course they have to shoulder responsibility, but how much blame do they actually get for what's going on? Because regardless of whether or not the manager is the ultimate power broker at the club, they're still the same group of players who were so dominant and brilliant last season. Absolutely, but it, it really infuriated me when they... This, well, not this complete set of plays, but when Chelsea done it to Mourinho, because it looked like power, player power was taking control at Chelsea, and we've seen it over the years. They're a very dominant changing room, led by John Terry, those type of guys, real, real characters as such. And when it happened against Mourinho, I was furious because there was no way that Mourinho was doing anything different. It literally was the players down tools and the, and the, the, the hierarchy of the club backed the players. It looks like they, they're capable of doing it again. Those players at Chelsea know that the managers change quite quickly and that they, if, if they're not getting on particularly well with one manager, it's very often that the manager gets trained, changed and they can start again. But yeah, I, I would look at those players and even the recruitment, I know Conte's made a big deal about it, but Matic and Costa going out have weakened that Chelsea team incredibly. Bakayoko coming in is nowhere near good enough in terms of what Conte and Matic were doing in central midfield last season. And, and the decision to change them to maybe reduce the age of that midfield just doesn't make any sense. Drinkwater was brought in He's only a year younger than Matic, so I didn't understand how they, the argument they were saying they were trying to re-energise the squad, it just didn't add up to me. Is it fair to say, Gary, that when Roman Abramovich makes a signing for himself, we often see it every summer, is that we ponder whether or not it's a manager signing or an ownership signing. Are we seeing this, the power of an ownership signing at this time of year when Roman Abramovich knows that he's signed a couple of these players, that their loyalty is to him and not to Antonio Conte? I bet there's, there's a, I, I would have no doubt that there's an open line between the players and the owners in terms of speaking and are they happy. And, and that happens at a lot of the modern day clubs now and it undermines the manager, of course it does, but Conte was adamant he wanted certain players, they didn't come in and he looked like he just started sulking the stuff. And, and rather than maybe sitting down in front of the board and discussing it that way, he's always taking his opportunity to talk into the press and say, listen, I'm doing a brilliant job 
Well, they're not. They, they, they really look like they're in danger now of going out of the Champions League um, top four places. And if that is the case, I think Chelsea probably will act soon because they cannot afford to be out of that. Like, who comes to Chelsea now and thinks, I'm going to be here for longer than 18 months? Like, who really will have the power ever to... No. To make the responsibility, to take the responsibility for the signings, to like it's it's, it's essentially a caretaker's job with good money. Well, with great money and a great opportunity to work with players at the top end of the game to to, to challenge for the title and for, and for Europe. And if any manager is looking at the situation, what's happened with Conte? There's none. Of, no manager going to really be put off. Maybe the top draw like Guardiola was never going to come in, but there'd be so many managers out there who will see this as a brilliant opportunity to go to Chelsea. And it was interesting that Conte have said this season, he said that he's seen all the managers before and the problems they had and he couldn't understand it. Well, now he understands it. And that's the difference. It's, it's, it's a short-term fix. And I think Chelsea fans, even though they're hearing a lot and they, they adore Conte, but even though they know what's happening now, they're just used to it. They know that it'll go, another one will come in. And that type of remit that Chelsea have had over the years has been so successful. So who can, how can you really argue with it? The um, upcoming games against Barcelona, like if... Mm. So what, what are we, today's the 6th and the next game is the 20th. The home leg is the 20th. So that's 14 days. If you fire him tonight, you get two weeks for somebody to come in and do that. If you don't fire him, then he's got to be around for those fixtures, right? Because you can't, I mean, they could, and they've done it before. They could fire him in mm. the middle of that. But do they give him that game to save his entire rest of season? Uh, it's, it's such a difficult one to call. If you're listening to his sound bites. And the way he's poking the owners and, and, and he's literally daring them to make the decision. It's as if Conte thinks, well, listen, I've had enough here, but I'm going to make sure I get my contract paid out in full. But Chelsea got a big decision to make because I think ultimately you may not like the manager, but you will look and see how are the players reacting to him. And likewise with Mourinho in that second season, they couldn't handle his intensity. It looks like it's the same scenario now with Conte, that these players are just not working as hard as they were initially because... In that first season under Conte, they were so determined, so organised and so difficult to break down. Out of possession, they literally went to a back seven. There was no space. And now you look at them now, they're unrecognisable. To concede seven goals in two games against the likes of Bournemouth and Watford suggests they're not putting that effort in. And that is the dilemma that that board have to look at now and think, has the race been run? Uh, the signing of Olivier Giroud kind of speaks to me about a, a club mm. that doesn't really care? I mean, what, what is Roman Abramovich? Does he really care about this club? I mean, as you mentioned yourself there, Antonio Conte is literally daring the ownership to sack him. It just it strikes me as a club with no ambition that the, the Olivier Giroud signing sums it up perfectly. Oh, listen, you can't say Chelsea don't have ambition in terms of the titles they've won. I just think that they, they just operate in a, in a different, different way as such. I think Olivier Giroud, for £18 million, you look at it as a good buy. I think Ross Bartley for these £15 million is a good buy in terms of the reduced um, transfer fees in comparison to what's happening at the moment. But they're two players you don't associate with Chelsea going on to win the Champions League. It's si as simple as that. And I think Giroud came in ultimately because Conte wanted a big man to lead the line. And even the names that were being suggested at the time, Peter Crouch at his age, Laurent Laurente hasn't done particularly well at Spurs. You know, these type of guys, Dzeko would have been a fabulous sign, of course he would, but... Even he looked at the situation, and any player will probably think that, yeah, Chelsea, going there is a, is a great opportunity, but it's not as if you're going to go there and look to play for the manager, because it doesn't look like he's going to be there. No, he'd be gone by the time the ink is dry in the contract. Mm. Um, let's talk a little bit, a bit about Jurgen Klopp against the officials. Um, this was one of the talking points from the weekend. Klopp said that uh, he couldn't tell us what he actually thought, otherwise he'd have to pay the biggest fine in the history of football. Um, I mean... Club is a genius when it comes down to media manipulation because here we are talking mm. about this as opposed to what the hell was he doing with his substitutions? Why couldn't his team see out a winning position at home in one of the biggest games of the season? What yeah. is their defensive structure and style? What are they trying to do? And just how much progress are they making? Instead, it's like, well, these officials, I mean, I'm going to drop a nuclear bomb of hate on them, but I'm actually not going to take any of the consequences for it. Well, he may well argue about the decisions, but... They've been proved right as such. The only thing is, is that there's so many different referees and in, in, uh, ex-referees, top referees, officials who are looking after the referees now, and, and even half of them are disagreeing with those decisions. So it's such a, it's, it's down to interpretation in terms of whether like 
Lovren was looking to play the ball. And they say a, the big term was, was it a deliberate action? Well, he obviously went to clear it. He gets a touch on it. There's no way he meant to flick it behind him. But then you can counter that and by say, well, listen, when I would give away a penalty, I didn't deliberately give it away. But nevertheless, it was a penalty. So it's, it's so difficult. But Klopp is right. I, I think managers are clever. They'll maybe take a little bit of the spotlight off. But you're right. If you go... 2-1 up that late in the game, you expect to see it through. And I mean, they may well argue that decisions went against them, but I, I would say that they were spot on. But if you're saying, yeah, about where do they go from here? I think I think the future is very bright for Liverpool. I think the frustration is that you can't see out that game in a massive battle for that Champions League spot. I think both Tottenham and Liverpool will be relieved. They wanted to take care of business themselves, but certainly they'll look at what's happening at Chelsea now and think, well, listen, we've got a great opportunity. They look like they're imploding. I don't think even Arsenal with those signings have got a good enough defence to challenge. So I would still expect Spurs and Liverpool to cement a Champions League place, but certainly it was a, it was a brilliant game to watch. What did you think of uh, Deli Ali diving yet again? Listen... <laughs> These modern day footballers, they're doing it all the time. And, and I think people are arguing in terms of Harry Kane diving for the penalty. But forwards now, they touch the ball. They make sure that they put their leg in an area where it can in, in, engage the contact. And then it's a decision for the referee to make. But it was a blatant dive. And the, the only concern for me in certain scenarios like that is that because the referee's seen it, they've booked him. There's no um, too much ban. If the referee hadn't seen it, I think it should be one rule across the board. If he has been booked for diving like that, it should still be a too much ban. If we had seen it and the referee hadn't seen it and they went to a panel afterwards, a retrospective ban would have seen him out of the Tottenham team. I think they need to be more consistent about that. Yeah, because that might actually have some impact in, in stamping mm. it out. And it might stop people doing it. Final point on, on Klopp and, and the future is bright. I can see the future for that group of players if they're all kept together and mm. a new goalkeeper being bright. But the difficulty that Liverpool have had over the last couple of seasons is every time a Fernando Torres or a Suarez or a Coutinho and now a Salah reaches the level they're at, the, mm. the world's biggest clubs come calling and Liverpool have traditionally over the last half decade or decade sold that player for a massive amount of money and tried yeah. to use it to rebuild. So th that moment has to come really, really soon for Liverpool. Yeah, that is the frustration. Of course it is. And you're right. The amount of money that they have got in for those top players, quite often they've wasted it. And that's the concern. You look like Liverpool on the cusp of having a really good team who could potentially challenge City and certainly close the gap. But I think Klopp is probably used to this. At Dortmund, he would have had the same scenario. He knew the market he was working in. He would get players in work, develop them. And the problem that he had at the time, he'd get them to the Champions League final. They're winning the Bundesliga. But then Bayern Munich flex their muscles and come and cherry pick his best players. So I think he will understand it. I think he's always looking for the next batch to come through. But it's just about timing. You just want to keep those group of players just together for, for six months, a season, to see whether or not they can actually win that elusive Premier League title. Uh, we'll move on, I guess, to uh, the next thing we wanted to chat about, which was Manchester United and Romelu Lukaku's role in this team. Mm. Because I was reading some interesting stuff from James Ducker at the weekend in the Daily Telegraph, and he spoke about how Manchester United set up on the back of Lukaku getting taken off at the weekend, and just more fluidity in the team, more speed, yeah. more pace, with Sanchez in the middle, and I think it was, um, who, who would it have been, Rashford and Martial either side of him, and then Pogba, crucially, Playing yeah, on the left of the three. midfield three, yeah. So, obviously, from a Pogba perspective, that's where they got the best out of him from Juventus. But I thought that little note about Sanchez playing in the nine role with Lukaku getting taken off for the first time in his Manchester United yeah. career without an injury was very, very interesting. Well, it was, and I think Mourinho will put a spin on it that Lukaku has played far too much football this season. Like you said, he, he, he's not missed a minute in, unless he's been injured. But certainly Sanchez, if you're thinking about Sanchez going there... You don't see him playing out on the wing as such in terms of like hugging the touchline, creating space. He's always driving through the middle. So I think there will be an option to play him at centre forward. And as you quite rightly said, then you've got those flying machines outside in Martial, Rashford. But the key point is, is Pogba. It's been proved he struggles in a two-man midfield. He got so exposed against Tottenham with Ericsson just playing in the pocket behind him. He's too advanced of the ball. We know how good for our, for our own sins, how good Ericsson is in those pockets. But certainly, the very fact that Mourinho dragged him with half an hour to go, didn't start him in the next game, suggests that he doesn't trust him in a two, despite him being a great athlete. And you're right to suggest that when we think of Pogba and, and at his brilliant best, it's running from deep into space and that left-hand side of a three-man midfield. And I think you need that extra man in there because 
he, he lacks discipline at times. He goes hunting the ball. He wants to be a star player. And, and the reality is you kind of want him in those advanced areas so he can do something. But I think it's, I think it's going to be a massive call now because in those big games in the big business end of the season, in big head-to-heads, may, may it be in the Champions League, I wouldn't be surprised if, if Lukaku doesn't start. Although, I um, just want to move on to the, the Arsenal game, um, although it was a hat-trick for Aaron Ramsey, a lot of people were saying that it was Mkhitaryan's just general mm. sense of spatial awareness and willingness to make those difficult runs and passes that actually allowed the free-flowing, free-scoring um, performance from Arsenal. Do you buy that? Is it too early to say that he's had that kind of impact? And, and what is the future for this group as a, as a forward unit at least? Oh, yeah. Well, listen, I think Mkhitaryan has got a, a perfect fit at Arsenal. He obviously struggled with the intensity of, of, of the demanding nature of Jose Mourinho in terms of every day. I think he'll enjoy the fact that he's far more relaxed at Arsenal in terms of centre for, um, forward players can literally go and play off the cuff. There's no settled play. There's no defensive responsibilities as such. And he's definitely a player that Wenger's admired for a long time. So th- that looks a really good sign. And it's a lucky one, really, because that's not by design. If Sanchez... Seen out his contract, there was no way he was going to be able to get Mkhitaryan in it as early as he has done. So I think it's worked out. I think he's been lucky there, Wenger. But certainly, Abami Yang as well looks like a centre forward of top quality. We know that. He's a temperamental type of player as well, but he may well thrive. But as much as they look great going forward, and, and they put Everton to the sword, who were particularly poor defensively, I think even Big Sam said they were a shambles. The reality is, is that Arsenal will break your heart. They'll be great going forward, but defensively, they're not good enough. And they are what they are. They're the sixth best team in the Premier League. I might just uh, get one last uh, point in there, Gary, and just to chat about Manchester City. Uh, like, there's, they're going to win the Premier League, but mm. like, I'm not sure was there certain signs of weakness at the weekend. And uh, like, How would you feel if you were an academy player for Manchester City now and Pep Guardiola feels six subs? Well, listen, I think more, more as the academy manager or the, or, or the youth team manager as such and you're developing these players. But I can counter it as well to say, well, listen, you can't just give a position to a player. He has to earn it. And if he feels that there's no one who has earned the right, then that, that's up to him. I think we can't ever accuse Pep Guardiola of not giving young players an opportunity. We've seen him develop the, the players out of the Barcelona academy into world-class players. We've seen the likes of Phil Foden get his opportunity in the Champions League and other young players as well. So it's not a scenario based on that. I think it's just something that people probably looked at and think, well, why don't you just give it the young players an opportunity just to be in and around the first team on a match day um, in terms of how they conduct themselves, what's expected of them. But as he rightly said, he rarely uses, the, you know, he really needs seven subs on the bench anyway. So, I mean, I think a lot's been made of it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take too much into it. And uh, anything, any worries about their most recent mini slump? <laughs> well... I think even listening to De Bruyne, I think they need these three days off. They're desperate for it. A lot of those players have played a lot of minutes. And, 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 it, and of course, they've been taking some robust challenges as well. So it just allows the body just to settle down, even the mind just to have a, re- a rest and recover to go again. But they're a fabulous team. And, and, and the new signing at centre-half looks like he's going to add to that. A left-sided centre-half who, who could come out comfortably and make the passes that we know that they like to do. But listen, Manchester City have been brilliant. And, and they're, they're, they're literally on the... They're going to have the title within the next month or so. Possibly at Old Trafford. Good stuff. Thanks a million. Thanks, guys.